this they missed out. Hey there. So I wanted to add a bonus. I, I didn't I didn't want to call it a part four because I was always calling everything a three part series, but I just wanted to let you guys see the final mix of Nostalgia and I wanted to talk about some different things I did in the mix to help, you know, the mix sound better and let you, you know, I'll tell you about some problems I encountered and different things I did in the mix to overcome those problems to uh, just get the best mix that I possibly could. Oh wait, you're saying you haven't heard my song, Nos you haven't heard Nostalgia before? You must, uh, I get it, it's like summertime you've probably been on vacation for a couple of months um so for those of you that have been like in the backwoods without internet um i put out this song called nostalgia i mean it practically took the internet by storm uh within the first couple of weeks it had a couple hundred views uh and now it's sitting at like 1300 or something so everyone's been talking about it i am sorry you missed out on it but i'm glad you're back uh, you know, you've got the internet now, you can go ahead and watch it and catch up to speed, kind of figure out what everyone's talking about on Twitter and Facebook and everything. So, okay, so first of all, the way I mixed this song was I, I believe I started out with the piano. I wanted to get the, the right sound for the piano, and I took a lot of inspiration from the piano tones and sounds in Copeland's newest album, Ixora. Um, I mean, the album's like two years old now or something, but uh, it's just such a warm, soft piano sound, and I really wanted to get that sound. Um, and I'm, I'm saying that all the while, I, I used a MIDI piano. It's actually a real, it's a real recording of a piano, but it's transposed into a virtual instrument that I can then pick and choose which notes I want. So, um, but I, I did a lot of... Um, where was it? Uh, just with the instrument itself, I, I did everything I could to get, uh, you know, a really soft sound and, you know, picking the dynamics and and everything. I really locked in that sound first um, in solo. I mean, that's all I was listening to was the piano sound as I was mixing the song. Um, so here's the, here's the sound. And I think I initially had it even softer than that. I had it pretty soft. As opposed to hard. Right? Um, so I, I had it all the way soft, and then as I got pretty far into the mix, I realized, you know what? It's just not cutting through the mix anymore, so I did end up boosting it up a little bit. And then with some EQ, I rolled off a ton of the low end. Um, here's what it sounds like with no EQ applied. Pay attention to the really deep sounds. I heard it's with EQ. Now without. Um, and maybe I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself, but while I had it open, I thought I'd talk about the EQ of the piano. The way I do EQ and the way that I've heard a number of producers do this, uh, and it's something that I started doing, I don't know, a little over a year ago probably, is doing my EQ moves in mono, and Reaper is super cool. It's got this little mono button right here where I can hear my entire mix instantly in EQ, or excuse me, in mono. So here it is in stereo. Bring me back to consciousness. Now here it is mono. Still stereo. I can feel the so it's got this cool little switch that puts everything to mono and that's the ideal situation to start doing EQ to your, your instruments. Uh, just because our ears kind of deceive us when it's in stereo and we can, you know, you can hear instruments a lot more clearly. You can hear the guitar and you know, the high guitar clearly in each headphone. And so you don't realize that um, some 
frequencies might be clashing, but you're still hearing it pretty well because it's separated in stereo. It's not until you flip it to mono that you start realizing that some instruments are masking each other and um, it's and everything's getting muddied up. Um, and so that helps you make better EQ decisions to make the instruments stand out and carve out maybe a little bit more of the low end or a little bit of the mid-range crud around 400 or 300, 500. So I did the piano, I added some of the guitars, and I started uh, just doing EQ. I did EQ first to every track. Then I went back and I did compression to every track to really breathe life into the instruments, um, get the volume where it needed to be, because some of these instruments are kind of dynamic, especially the vocals. Uh, the verses are so quiet with the vocals. Can't focus what's in front of me. And then the chorus gets really loud. So compression helped a ton. Uh, let me just show you the what I did with the compressor on the vocals. Sorry that if this is kind of all over the place. I'm, I'm hoping that this video ends up being helpful. I, I doubled up the compressor. I added a compressor with a, a pretty low ratio, and uh, then I doubled it. I just copied the same compressor on top of each other, and that really brought the vocals out. So to sum up that part, I started with EQ of the main instruments. I added other things in. I added the drums in, and then I moved on to compression. I set up some auxiliary tracks, so all of these blue tracks here, aux band, aux drums, double drums, aux, vox, 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 whatever. An auxiliary track is also known as a bus track or a group track. This is a, a track that, as you can see, doesn't actually have an instrument on it. It doesn't have a, you know, a, a recording clip, you know, on top of the track or anything. Um, this is basically a channel that I have instruments routed through so that I can apply effects globally to a certain amount of tracks at the same time. So reverb is a great example of this where you will, um, I've got another one right here, a reverb track where specifically I have, uh, it's, in fact it's showing right here all of the different, where it says receives. Um, these are all of the different instruments that are being sent to this reverb track so that they all are receiving the same amount of reverb and it makes it feel like the band, like a band performed the song at the same time. I do have a video that I've uploaded about reverb. Um, I didn't really dive too much into, I didn't dive into at all setting up auxiliary tracks and stuff for reverb. I tried to keep that video as simple as possible. But as you can see, there's uh, 12 or 15 different tracks dumping into that reverb, and then you can still fine tune it on each track to make sure that one particular track isn't receiving too much, or sometimes I wanted other tracks to receive more reverb, and so you can you can kind of uh, customize it that way. Okay, so at this point, the mix was sounding pretty good, and so usually when I'm, I know I'm not done with the mix and I haven't mastered it or anything, I will export it and email it to myself so that I've got it, I can pull it up on my phone and I can listen to it on my utterly terrible phone speaker. I can listen to it with headphones. Um, so I spent a couple of days actually listening to it at work, uh, in the car, just different settings so I could hear what the mix sounded like at this point, which is a huge thing because you do kind of get desensitized by uh, when you're listening to it with headphones or even just the same studio monitors. If that's all you're referencing your track on, uh, you just start, I've already used the word, but you, you start getting desensitized by how it sounds and you stop noticing some blatantly obvious things that need correction. Um, so it's always good practice to take a step back, take a couple of days off, honestly, and just stop stop mixing the song for a while uh, and listen to it on a different format. So when I did, uh, I noticed as I was walking into work, I was listening to it on these Apple earbuds, and I noticed that the vocals were just too quiet. Um, kind of a simple fix. I just turned up the vocals a little bit more. Also, um, I noticed that the sound of the book dropping, if you watched the How I Write a Song series, the offbeat, uh, I guess, snare type sound in the song is actually the sound of a book dropping on the floor. So here it is. I, 
think that was the Where's Waldo thin hard copy book dropping on the ground. Um, but I noticed that it was just too thin. I had shaved off way too much of the low frequencies with EQ. I think I used this EQ for some reason. It's It was a free EQ plugin that came with my audio interface, so I thought I'd try it out. Um, but you'll notice that the low frequencies here around 200 hertz, I boosted it by about five or six decibels. Initially, I had shaved off some of those low frequencies because uh, at the moment it just sounded like the right thing to do. But taking a step back and listening to the song on a different format made me realize that I needed to boost the low frequencies. So here's what it sounds like when I boost the low frequencies on this um, on the book dropping. Um, so obviously I took it to two extremes, boosted it a lot and cut it a lot so you could hear the difference there. But I found a happy medium that I, I knew I just needed to increase that low uh, beefy sound a bit in the book snare. I don't know what to call that. And then I noticed that the final chorus, this is more of like a songwriting thing. This is something that I just uh, didn't have totally fleshed out when I finished this this series, you know, part three of how I write a song, I noticed that the final chorus was just lacking energy. It needed a lift somehow. And my go-to typically for a lift in energy is to bust out my tambourine. Um, I don't know where it is, but I have a tambourine. And that made all the difference for the final chorus let me show you it without the tambourine and then I'll have it come in. So here's the final chorus without the tambourine. Now with the tambourine. Super, super subtle, but it just like lifts that last chorus and made a huge difference. I was very pleased with uh, the results of that. Look at the EQ I did on that thing. So I shaved off up to like a thousand hertz is completely gone. I'd, I had no need for that really low sound of the tambourine. And then it was a little too bright, so I cut off some of the high frequencies. And I'm left with just some of the mid-range stuff. And I... Uh, let's see, I added quite a bit of reverb to it to help it sit well in the mix and just find a right, found a right balance of all of those. And I think the final thing I wanted to share is that I've got this reference track. I've mentioned this in some, uh, some other videos, is that you need to compare your songs to a professionally mixed and mastered song of a similar genre. Maybe it doesn't have to be a similar genre, but just compare it to a professionally mixed song so you know if you are on the right track. It's a song by Copeland. So here is their song. It's worse than Let's see. So you listen to that for a little while, and then you mute it and listen to yours. And I noticed that the reference track, the drums, had a lot more reverb to them. And then I would go back to my track and be like, oh wow, the drums are just a little too up front and it's kind of, I don't know, taking away from the cohesion of the whole mix. And so, as a result of that, I, on, I think it was on my drum bus, my auxiliary drum track, so again, all the drum parts are routed through this drum bus, and I threw a reverb on there. Now without it. Hopefully some of the stuff I shared with you in this uh, little series 
was enlightening on how I got the you know results that I got with my song, whether you think those results were good or bad. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm quite happy with how the song turned out. And that's it. <laughs>